uh, wait, going live as soon as, yeah, uh, you can start. Yep. Yeah. So uh, welcome everyone uh, to this second edition of our uh, non-permission seminar series. Uh, today we are delighted to have uh, Professor Odette Silverberg uh, join us today. Um, he obtained his PhD from Weizmann Institute in Tel Aviv, and uh, then he did a postdoc at ETH. After a brief period of uh, corporate research, uh, he became a SNF uh, assistant professor at ETH. And then since 2021, he has taken the role of the W3 Heisenberg professor at the University of Constance. So it's safe to say uh, that Odette's expertise spans many dimensions, pun intended. His research interests include quantum transport in mesoscopic systems, uh, weak measurements, fractional quasi-particles, photonic, nanomechanical systems, and many more. And he's particularly fascinated by the interplay of many body interactions out of equilibrium dynamics and parametric driving. And during today's seminar, I think he will provide an overview of how strong correlations uh, in open quantum systems can lead to uh, many phenomena ranging from impurity physics to annihilation or melting of exceptional points. So to far, with, uh, without further ado, I uh, invite uh, Odette to take the stage. OK, so uh, first of all, thank you, Javier, for this very uh, kind Hello, I think can, you, I think. Ah, can you hear me? Yeah. Ah, OK. So, so first of all, thank you, Javier, for this really kind introduction. And I also wanted to thank all of you for organizing this uh, session on, on open, open uh, system dynamics and uh, with focus on, on what is interesting with, with non-hermitian uh, things. I'm actually very, very passionate about these things. And it uh, stands at the, at the culmination point of, of more or less everything that we do in in uh, the research, research activity in my group. Uh, I have tried to put a lot of strong correlations inside, but of course we know that the strong correlation needs a lot of coherence. And uh, we know that open systems tend to decohere our dynamics. And in that sense, I decided to go along a more uh, stepped up path. We're gonna do a lot of uh, mean field in the beginning, see some semi-classics and then try to extend and at and postulate, and I will then uh, show a couple of uh, of highlights on on where the uh, environment is in fact leading to new coherent effects uh, afterwards. Uh, feel free to stop me at any time, and I would uh, be very happy if it's more of an educational talk than me flashing results. Um, so. Uh, Without further ado, I would like to start. I just want to also highlight that a lot of these non-emission dynamics are at the core of this SFB that is running at uh, Constance, where we are focusing on out of equilibrium and fluctuations in non-linear systems. And this is then technically um, yeah, going to hopefully come out of my talk. And then on top of it, you will see that, that we're developing also some codes. And uh, there, I should give lots of credit to to Javier, where uh, many of these physics that I will report on are now easily solved using this uh, numerical package. So let's start. So that's me uh, starting with thanking people. And I also wanted to thank all of the various collaborators I worked with over the years uh, on this topic. And I will also show many results uh, with collaboration with the group of Tilman Hensliger and Tobias Donner at ETH, and also with Alexander Eichel and Chita, um, also from ETH. And this is uh, group members from before. A picture of the current group members at Constance will appear at the end, because we are continuing with the work to do new, new results on non-hermitian and open system dynamics. So um, this I already said. Technically, if we are interested in a, many body system, where usually then uh, in a Hamiltonian coherent result thereof, say we're more focused on the closed quantum aspects of, of our systems, we are then trying to take many of our particles, couple them together in different ways in our Ham Hamiltonian language. And uh, here, for example, this could be then uh, many 
atoms that are then mediated, uh, having mediated interaction via coupling to some cavity, but this is then always going to be in what we call Hamiltonian. And then we are interested in finding out what kind of coherent many body effects can come out from this uh, coupling. However, at the same time, we are always going to have the open system around. It means all of the other degrees of freedom in our systems that we have neglected and our system in reality is also going to couple to them. Okay, and this is going to compete for the attention span of all of these systems and it's going to then uh, effectively damp our system or lead to open system dynamics and also to non Hermitian uh, effects when we are tracing out over this ensemble of these degrees of freedom that we don't know how to take care of in our closed system. Um, to complete what an open system adds to our closed system dynamics, we also can then drive the system, we could shake it, we could do many more things to it. And then on top of that, we're going to ask what kind of coherent drives or noisy incoherent drives can we apply to the system in order to take it deep, deeply out of equilibrium and see how the competition between these drives, the dissipation by coupling to all of the other degrees of freedom and these coherent dynamics that we were interested in the, in, in the first place are going to, to, what are they going to give us in the end? Okay. Um, uh, in some sense, all of this is then related to things that we study in statistical physics, because we're interested then in many, many particles that are coupled together. <clears throat> and all of what I was saying about the closed system versus open system manifests also in how we are looking at uh, phase transitions. So usually phase transitions in a closed system, so if we would imagine, for example, a zero temperature system, we could have a closed system, we have a potential energy landscape as in over some parameter space. And then if we have, say, uh, a global minimum in our system, we could find that our order parameter x0 is characterizing how the system is going to look like in the minimum of this uh, potential energy landscape. Then a quantum phase transition occurs when we are moving from this global minimum to another global minimum in the system where then this would manifest as a jump uh, in the, or a transition in our order parameter, in our uh, classical observation of the system, this average observation of our system. Um, so because it's at the ground state, this is then what people like to call a quantum phase transition and it's fully at the ground state and uh, fully closed system because all I had to do is to change my potential energy landscape. So I have conservative, in uh, the language of uh, analytical mechanics, I only have conservative forcing over uh, my uh, system. Um, of course, still in equilibrium statistical physics, I could couple my system to a bath and assume with what happens to my distribution function at the notion of having a temperature to my system. So I, I'm at equilibrium, I have a good notion of a temperature. And in that sense, I could think of uh, melting, say, this ground state order that came from the zero temperature by increasing the temperature. And, and then it's, a, it's more or less like feeling uh, filling water into this landscape. And then at a certain point, my mean observation is going to be in the middle. And this is then uh, characterized with critical temperatures and is going under the name of ordered to disordered phase transitions. Okay, still all at standard uh, uh, equilibrium statistical physics. Uh, a note to, as a side comment is that uh, statistical physics, what is nice about equilibrium is that we can come up with a, a good ansatz for our probability distribution functions of where the particles should be. And this goes to all of the canonical, microcanonical, and grand canonical ensembles that we commonly study. This uh, framework doesn't occur anymore in open systems we don't, we, because we don't have any more conservations, right? Our system then opens up to have not only conservative forcing on our particles. It also has non-conserving forcing. So it means that we could lose our particles or we could increase our particles by our drives. And that means that technically it's much uh, more useful to then uh, take these two types of forcing on our system and see how they impact the trajectories of our particles 
uh, in phase space. So this is, for example, phase space for bosonic particles, where I have the real and imaginary part of, of some uh, coherent state. So the conservative forcing will give me these potential energy lines where I would like to have closed trajectories that are conserving energy. But on top of it, uh, non-conserving forcing, and here uh, for the experts, I'm now assuming that this is some sort of a, uh, Markovian without a memory kernel type of forcing, they are just going to uh, act as arrows that additionally Im impact and force my particles to move somewhere in phase space, okay? The combination of these uh, conservative and non-conservative forcing is what then enters as what we call drift terms. And these drift, ter drift terms are then better described than as uh, stream plots of where the particles would like to then um, center in their or in phase space or in parameter space. And uh, now we can go and ask ourselves what are out of equilibrium phase transitions. And these out of equilibrium phase transitions then could look very similar to what we saw in the equilibrium cases. It's just that now the drift forces, the competition between conservative and non-conservative uh, forcing could either make me have an attractor over here, a single one at this order parameter, characterized by this order parameter, or I could change now either the conservative forcing to make myself have a double well, or alternatively also the non-conservative forcing, such that I have now a, two attractors, and these two attractors are then separated by a separatrix. Okay, this a description over here is at the equivalent of a zero temperature limit that can also exist in the out of equilibrium cases. But I can now also here apply additional uh, fluctuations on top of my um, open system and melt the order as we saw also in the equilibrium case. Okay, so this is kind of like a, a general framework. I, I'm sure many of you know it or heard about it. I just wanted us to have it once told and that we could now see it uh, manifesting as, a, as something that ongoes when we are applying then this type of methodologies to different uh, systems. Okay, um, from non-Hermitian and open system dynamics, uh, I want to also include two keywords. So here we like to think about Hamiltonians, okay? Um, in the distribution functions, we like to think about partition functions. Partition functions also carry over to the out of equilibrium realms, but of course, these type of dynamics as we see them over here are then no longer uh, conservative. So it's not a Hamiltonian. We need then a, either a Liouvillean or, or some Markovian approximant uh, such as a Lindblad. Okay, so that's just to say that. And then on top of it, uh, probably when we are dealing with non-hermitian, one of the interesting things that then people nowadays talk about are uh, types of exceptional points that can appear in the system. And in that sense, I would like to just highlight one additional key thing that, that then repeats throughout the discussion that we will see today is that, for example, if I'm sitting in a local phase, out of equilibrium phase of my system, in a close vicinity over here, I am effectively quadratic, okay? It could be that in the large phase space landscape, it's very complicated with hills and valleys uh, all around uh, phase space. But in the local environment, I can think of it that the, that the particles trapped here are effectively going to experience physics that look very similar to a harmonic uh, oscillator or because of the openness of the system to a dissipative harmonic oscillator. So this is kind of then captured by this notion of this parabolic potential over here. And towards the end of my talk, I'm gonna talk about how quantum mechanically we could treat corrections uh, to it due to interactions. Um, what is important to remember that we already see usually from uh, you know, classical mechanics one courses is that the harmonic oscillator has a, com the dissipative harmonic oscillator has usually a competition between having the ability to oscillate in this confining potential with some given characteristic uh, resonance frequency 
But at a certain point, there is a ratio between the damping forcing and the resonance frequency that is going to make the particle move from being underdamped, underdamped, namely it oscillates. And uh, you could still see the oscillation frequency until the oscillation decays to an overdamped uh, um, motion, namely where you release the particle and it's just going to go down like a potato. It's not going to oscillate at all. Okay. At the transition between underdamp to overdamp transition, we have an exceptional point in the in the Jacobian of these particles motion. And this is, uh, if we want to think about the physics of exceptional points and on our emission stuff, this is effectively what we should always keep in the back of our mind, that the open system, the non-Hermitian complement made it that the closed system, the coherent oscillation is being then overtaken. Okay, so this is something I want us to, to make sure that we remember and that we remember that this manifests here at any minimum over here. Okay, so th that means that the moment uh, we overwhelmed this, that means that effectively there is nothing that looks like a nice con parabolic confining potential and the system uh, would either just be overdamped but stuck here or it would signal that the system doesn't want to stay around here anymore and it wants to move to another location in phase space that will signal a phase transition. So that was very, very uh, um, generalistic and abstract. And now I would like to then go and exemplify these, these ideas on, on various uh, examples, okay? Uh, so if you have questions until now, please feel free to, to ask. Uh, uh, the, and the chat question was not for me. The chat comment was not for me. Okay, good. Um, if there are no questions, uh, Javier, you need to tell me, should I take questions or should I just talk? Please, please uh, feel free to take questions. But I think there is none. <laughs> none at the moment. Okay. Not good. at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So, so we are applying this general notion and, and philosophy. And I mean, it's, we are not the only ones. This is, of course, what we are teaching <laughs> as physicists. But uh, in, in the research group, in, in, in my research group, we are applying it to a, a variety of systems. We're interested both in the uh, quantum optics realm, where we have light matter systems, where this uh, notion of drive, openness, and many bodies easily, uh, you know, we don't need to have a lot of imagination to understand how the, this picture here is related to my introduction until now. Uh, but we're also applying it then to, to standard mesoscopic electronic systems and where the environment cannot can also at a certain point uh, be sufficiently coherent that it could lead to, to then strongly correlated effects and uh, and uh, um, quantum phase transitions so many body instabilities uh, at the end i hope to still be able to say two words about that uh, but before going into that uh, Let's start with the first example, okay? So light matter systems, probably the majority of you uh, have seen in the, the quantum optics uh, go-to model where we have a notion of an optical cavity that is coupled to a, to a two-level spin degree of freedom. Okay, so here the, the spin degree of freedom is sitting in some magnetic field that splits the energy, the cavity is empty, but due to the coupling between the spins and the cavity, the, they can actually activate each other. And here we are already seeing this uh, as a simplified Hamiltonian that can be exactly uh, solved. Okay, so that's a notion of uh, how we could think about coupling different degrees of freedom and how we build up a closed system, right? So I want to emphasize we're a Hamiltonian over here. And then we usually we are then interested in how the say the eigenstates and what is the lowest energy eigenstate in the system that is going to be the exact solution of, of these coupled dynamics between different types of degrees of freedom. Um, we could take this to many body and look at the Dickey model. So here I now have an ensemble of two level systems that are then not talking to one another. So without this lambda x term 
all of these two level systems are just decoupled and point down and the cavity is empty. And here I have now in a, a coupling that again, whenever a two level system say swallows a photon from the cavity, it can flip up. And when it flips down, it can emit a photon into the cavity. Um, what is nice and then also takes us to more extensive notion of a many body system is that there is a funny many body phase transition in the system again it's a closed system okay so there is nothing driving the system the system is either really empty and decoupled and all spins point down but at a certain point there is going to be fluctuation in the system. So there's going to be a little bit of photons uh, being uh, generated, for example, by the, by the vacuum fluctuations of the cavity. And it could trigger that such a coupling term light, lights up. And there is a critical coupling term beyond which the uh, ground state of the system is no longer the end empty cavity and the all spins pointing down. In fact, it starts to then be that there is light in the cavity. The light likes to spontaneously uh, generate light by this model. And the spins are no longer po pointing only downstairs on average. OK, so, so that is what is known as the Dickey phase transition. And um, in a closed system, it sounds a little bit magical. It's as it sounds a little bit like a perpetual mobile, if you wish. Right? Because you have a system that generates light all the time by itself, just due to quantum fluctuations. And there was a lot of debate whether something like this should at all exist in a, in a closed system. OK? Generally, we could all continue to study these closed systems of Miltonians, and we could then uh, generalize them and think about coupling of the uh, x uh, orientation of our spins to some. Uh, position displacement of our cavity and say uh, y uh, axis of our spins to the momentum of our cavity. And this is then a, a family of types of models that are then uh, going under the name of the interpolating Dickey Davis Cummings uh, model, where you could then, again, you can embed this type of uh, competitions between different coupling mechanisms in the system. So when these are too small to in, introduce an instability. The cavity is empty. All of the spins are pointing down. If I only light up the x, I'm going to have the standard Dickey phase transition over here. If I only light up y, I'm going to have a standard Dickey phase transition, but now in the y direction. And technically, if these prefactors are going to be the same, there's going to be a, an increased symmetry to the model, a U1 symmetry, which is called then the Tavis Cummings limit of the model where there is going to be uh, no preference as to whether you should uh, fall in the x or in the y direction. And you have a general u1 spontaneous symmetry breaking to the problem. When we are looking at the impact of the spins on the effective uh, quasi-energy potential landscape for the cavity, we could really just think of these potential landscapes as we saw in the beginning of my talk. So when these couplings are below criticality, there is one global minimum at the empty cavity, as you see over here. The symmetry breaking in X makes it that we have something that looks like a cowboy hat with two minima at the, along the real axis of the cavity. Okay, And, and this is this spontaneous sim Dickey uh, symmetry. It's a Z2 phase transition that we're talking about. And in the Y, it's along the imaginary part of the cavity. And the Tavis Cummings has this U1 symmetric hat. OK, so the, we could see it truly as an energy manifold. And you, where the symmetry just tells you, hey, I'm falling. Now my state spontaneously chooses to be over here. OK? Now, um, Again, there are these questions. Can I at all realize something like this? Because I will have then a, a system that effectively has light in it and and why should it at all happen and indeed it wasn't realized for a very long time such a, a model but it was realized in an open system dynamics okay so effectively uh, there were experiments the first experiments in the group of uh, Tilman Esslinger where they took uh, BCS of cold atoms and they 
cool them to the to the lowest uh, momentum state in a transverse pump here. Okay, so there is light impinging on these atoms. In a mirror, the the atoms fall and make this. Uh, um, you know, they like to attract to the highest uh, light intensity. So they're making these stripes over here. And, and then that's where they like to be. That's then the ground state of, or like the stationary state of this system. But what they have seen is that if they increase the pump strength, because of fluctuations in the light, there's going to be a displacement. The atoms are going to eat a photon, get a little bit of recoil motion, and as they relax back down to the BCS, they're going to emit photons out. And at a certain point beyond some pumped intensity, light starts to light up in a cavity that is completely transverse to where the light is being impin impinging, okay? And the um, nice thing about this demonstration is that they could actually take this microscopic dynamics that I'm describing and map them onto this Dickey model, but in a rotating frame and in an open uh, state environment, right? So now it's not surprising that there could be all of a sudden something that drives light into the, this cavity. It comes from the fact that we had the pump in the first place, okay? It's just that now the dynamics, of this microscopic dynamics is arriving in a rotating wave approximation relative to this whole pump story that I'm telling you over here. And one additional important thing is that now we're in an open setting. So this open setting allows you to kind of emulate Hamiltonian dynamics, but it also automatically makes it that you're non-hermitian, you're open. So the effective uh, description or, and prediction of where this phase transition should occur uh, lends itself to then to a Lindblad-like, it can be described using a Lindblad-like evolution where the Hamiltonian term, the coherent term is a rotating wave approximation and truncation of all of these microscopic degrees of freedom that looks identical to this Hamiltonian that I show you over here. But on top of it, we are having a cavity that loses uh, photons using such a Lindblad term over here. Okay, so we're automatically non-hermitian here. Um, so how does one treat such a system, right? It's a, it's a lecture series, so I, I figured that it's also good to give some, some under the hood type of calculations. How do you analyze these open type of systems? So we have many, many, many particles. So the first thing we could uh, start to decide to do is to make some sort of a mean field ansatz, okay? To say, okay, I, I don't really need that all of these degrees of freedom act like their individual quantum two-level systems. I can sum them up and look at this uh, ensemble of two-level systems as an effective large magnetic moment, a classical magnetic moment, okay? So that's then the average that you see over here. Um, on top of it, I can also assume a semi-classical coherent state in, this, in, the, in the cavity. Plugging such an ansatz into this many-body Hamiltonian, you are actually, actually it's now I'm already plugging it into the Lindblad that I told you before. I'm going to obtain equations of motion for my order parameters for this X, Y, and Z, and for the cavity fields over here. And I'm interested in stationary solutions to it, right? The points where the uh, competition between the conservative forcing that comes in the Lindblad equation from commuting with the Hamiltonian and the non-conservative forcing that comes from the dissipation from the cavity. And how are they going to give me something that will give me a stationary observation for these order parameters? So here, usually I would have had something that looks like an X dot, Y dot, Z dot, and alpha dot, or sorry, here I should have X dot, Y dot, uh, alpha real dot, and alpha imaginary dot. And I equate it to zero to find a stationary solution to this. Um, interestingly, you could actually solve these. Uh, they, they look misleadingly simple, <laughs> these four equations but they're actually having a nonlinear uh, conservation law for the length of the magnetic moment. So it, it was actually a little bit painful to solve them analytically, but this is uh, possible and was uh, done in this paper over here. Um, 
And uh, what we observe is that we have various solutions to the problem, but that now, if we are looking, for example, at where should the uh, cavity field look like at the different stationary solution, it doesn't look identical to what we would have expected from only the closed system dynamics. Okay, so specifically due to the fact that we have this photon dissipation, we see that the cavity field indeed wants to start to point in the real direction and not the imaginary, but actually not exactly only in the real di direction. This is the what you see here that it's not blue here, but there is a little bit of blue over there. In the same, the same way also along the y direction, there is a little bit of blue over here and not only red uh, there. And most crucially, we see that this line where we would have expected this high symmetry line from this Davis Cummings type model, this is completely wiped away by the dissipation. Okay, so the dissipation makes it that this U1 high symmetry was, was kicked out. Okay, so that's one thing that we observe just by doing even this mean field. Now, is this enough? Do we, do we now understand everything about the, the, the model? Um, so we were not sure whether we trust our mean field and it's uh, very classical as it, as it seems over here, right? So what we did was to go and study quantum fluctuations on top of this classical mean field ensemble. And for this, what you could do is you can take this large magnetic moment and, and perform a transformation called holstein primakov where you're mapping the fluctuations around such, an, uh, such a you know, semi-classical pointing of where the, the spins look at, and you map it to, an, to a resonator. So it means that every time a, one of these two level systems are going to flip, it's as if you are now rotating this magnetic moment as a pendulum. And the transformation is written over here. And that makes it that on top of any of these stationary solutions that we are finding here from our mean field ansatz, we can now look at the quantum mechanical uh, quadratic Hamiltonian to find the quantum fluctuations on top. Okay, so when you're doing this type of analysis, you then find your mean field solutions and then you get a fluctuation Hamiltonian. But actually, we should also not forget it's actually a fluctuation Lindblad. Okay, so I'm, I'm just writing the Hamiltonian, but we're in an open system. So it's going to be looking like uh, coupled um, bosonic modes from the fluctuations. And they're also still going to be dissipative. Specifically, however, you should see, we took this many body problem in the end, it boils down to look like two coupled macroscopic degrees of freedom. And their fluctuations are again, going to look like fluctuations of two modes where we have then the fluctuations of the light, the fluctuations of the magnetic moment, coupling thereof. And because our magnetic moment was nonlinear, we are going to have also squeezing term onto the fluctuation on top of the, of the magnetic moment, okay? So we can take the forcing now for the quantum fluctuations, and we're gonna see, is it echoing, um, echoing what we thought that we get from the mean field, okay? The mean field is the equivalent of finding these hotspots that I showed to you in the beginning in phase space. And the fluctuation tells you how and what happens when I sample a small environment, this small harmonic oscillator environment around each of these phases, okay? So we're solving these fluctuations and what we find in this phase space is, is actually a little bit richer than what I showed to you before. First of all, we see that the Z2 phase transition that we saw before, this Dicky phase transition is indeed characterized by the fact that, okay, when I'm deep in my phase, I don't have a problem with my fluctuations and they are, they are stable. However, at a certain point, as I get close to the phase transitions, the fluctuations explode as I would have expected that should happen because I have to move now to have a different order in my system. And the same happens from the other side and this marks the fact that they have a Z to say phase transition. However, what we see over here is a very weird thing. This area around where I used to have my U1 symmetry seems to be completely wiped away now. And I have not matching green and red fluctuations. I only see that the red phase abruptly ends here 
or that the blue phase abruptly ends over here. But in fact, by looking at the fluctuations, we then realized that this empty cavity phase coexists here and exists here also. So there is only fluctuations over here that would tell you and mark to you that the empty phase wants to also exist here. OK? And uh, this is a, a marking of a first order phase transition. OK? It means that we're going to have uh, here, beyond here, due to this competition between the dissipation and the two different drives, we can have that the two drives are competing and the dissipation tells them, you know what? Just keep the cavity open, uh, empty. OK? But of course, if you would have told a different story of saying, let's first do the set phase transition, and now you're pointing already at a different phase, the, cav the dissipation tells it, OK, you, you already like to point in the y direction. I don't want to fight with you about it. But only beyond some threshold, that at a certain point, it tells you, OK, now I don't allow you to keep light in the cavity anymore. OK? Um, all of what I'm telling you, you could also, instead of just looking at correlators for your fluctuations, as we're looking over here, here we're looking at the fluctuation photo number in, in the cavity. You can also do by diagonalizing your fluctuation um, uh, lint blood. And then you're uh, exactly seeing that the fluctuations on top of the different phase spaces look exactly like what I told you before. They look like some sort of harmonic oscillators with some frequency. That's what the solid lines tell us. And lifetimes, that's what the dashed lines tell us. OK, so along this cut over here, for example, we see that the normal phase, the empty phase, has some fluctuations, right? Quantum mechanical. There, this will be some phononic uh, modes that are then filled by quantum fluctuations until at a certain point they can no longer sustain it because their lifetimes becomes positive. And beyond this exceptional point, another phase manifests. And then it has this phase has its own new fluctuations, as we see over here. OK. And here in the coexistence region, there are two types of attractors that can exist, each with its own local fluctuations around it. OK, I see the time is going on. This all exceptional points, et cetera, is, this is related exactly to squeezing, as we should know from underdamped to overdamped uh, transitions. Um, OK, so the punchline here, the take home message is that, um, that um, you know, from a closed system, we could start to get completely different phase diagrams coming out just by even adding a very, very, very simple dissipation term. And that tells us that non-Hermitian dynamics and all of the various different observables and uh, social uh, relationships between exceptional points and phase transitions and, uh, and many body and mean field fluctuations, they are all uh, interlinked. And they all tell us, try to uh, coherently tell us the same story <laughs> at the same time, OK? Um, and we should know that whenever we are trying to look, for example, at a many body uh, uh, experiment, if we are looking at the long time dynamics, most likely we are more interested in the open system, the non Hermitian stationary states of the systems. And then it could easily be that, that things that should have existed only uh, in the closed system are no longer relevant. So, for example, crucially, I want to highlight that in this whole region over here, this top of this, of this hat is becoming. Uh, an acceptable, it's an excited state in the closed system, but due to dissipation, it becomes an acceptable stationary state for the system. And it's very similar to, to the Kapita pendulum, where technically the, this pendulum could be actually uh, stabilized where, where all of the, um, where, where the pendulum points up. In this case, it's not like the spins point up in this state, but in fact, Javier, Maybe in the near future, we'll tell you about the case where the dissipation actually can even stable them to all point up. <laughs> um, last, uh, as a comment, uh, after this uh, prediction and discussion of, of, of such dissipation stabilized phases, um, 
uh, there was a, then a, a later experiment by the Esslinger group with Tobias Donnell, where using two types of Raman transitions for their atoms, they were able to exactly uh, observe such quenching of, of U1 lines and hysteretic responses in, in these things. So, but I will uh, just delegate you to this work. Um, so I hope that this was a nice de demonstration of, of how we could have attractors and how we could have small fluctuations around attractors and how many body gives us exactly this type of, of descriptions and how indeed we could move from a single creature like this to two in these transitions. And in fact, we had the competitions between a breaking in this direction or a breaking in this direction or even higher symmetry lines along the way. And that how changing on and off, for example, in the case now of this interpolating Davis Cummings, we could, uh, by the non-coherent drift force, completely destroy, for example, this U1 symmetry that we would have wanted to have in the closed system. And stabilize, in fact, even points like that would have been here at the top of the double well. OK, so this is these are the take home messages of this. And uh, now I am going to change gears and I will tell you corollary examples, <laughs> okay? So for example, now you could make it more complicated. You could sh start to shake the system, right? We said that we want to have the system have many body that are coupled to one another, coupled to other degrees of freedom, like for example, losing photons to an environment. But now, for example, there were, uh, some experiments again in Esslinger's group and then afterwards in Hamburg, in Hemerich's group, where they started to shake the pump intensity that was impinging on the atoms. And if you do the exercise, you could see that in the rotating wave picture, it looks effectively like a Dickey type model, but with a time dependent coupling term. If you do the whole exercise, et cetera, and you look at your mean field, you start to see that your mean field forms all sorts of limit cycles and very weird motion to the system. And uh, there is a whole stability diagram that I will not have time to explain at the moment where there are some instability thresholds beyond which uh, you would have wanted to be in an empty cavity, but due to this shaking, the, the um, the cavity starts to flash light periodically. Okay, that's that's how what should be read out of this sequence of pictures. Um, all in all, when you look at it, then it's you can actually see that the mag semi-classical magnetic moment starts to process under the fact that you're periodically pumping it with the light intensity that was impinging on the cavity and in the presence of the sink. So this is only available due to this competition between the pump and the sink that makes it that there is now a stationary motion for the, for the two level systems. Um, continuing with this analysis has led to us to, looking, to look also at these uh, fluctuations on top of this uh, response of such a model. And it looked like coupled harmonic oscillators with time dependence. And then we realized that, uh, wait a second, all of what we have been doing started from something very quantum mechanical and coupled to an environment, but in the end, our observables were semi-classical and the fluctuations, we were not even sure why they need to be quantum mechanical or why what should even happen when you start to time shake the coupling between harmonic oscillators. So for this, it got us along a very long path of looking at what happens when you start to shake systems. And we got all the way back to seeing first experiments by Faraday, seeing all sorts of nonlinear dynamic responses of what happens when you take many body systems and shake them. So he was shaking a, a, a fluid and seeing all sorts of interesting responses. And then this was uh, boiled down to look like uh, parametric coupling of two resonators. So here's a tuning fork that was stretching and unstretching a, a, a wire. This is Melde was, was doing that in the 1860s. And Riley formulated all of this then afterwards as a time dependent differential equation also still in the, in the uh, 19th century. Um, but we don't teach it <laughs> in undergrad courses. And because it's a non-conservative force, this time-dependent shaking, right? We are not going to conserve energy. So 
what is going to happen is that every time that people then found it and started to deal with it, they were like, oh, that's very interesting. And then they found all sorts of applications. So, I mean, most of the communication devices have some sort of a magnetic amplifier in them. And uh, in Bell Labs, the Varactor diode has been invented and has been everyday used. And we, even nowadays, modern superconducting uh, parametric amplifiers are then uh, uh, used for quantum computation with these infrastructures. So, but, but these applications are not only quantum. Okay, so the applications appear also in daily life. So for example, in, in the freighters, due to the shaking from from waves, uh, big freighter, freighter uh, ships can actually enter into something that is called parametric roll that can be very horrendous and can even lead to things that look like this, but this is another type of instability, okay? So, I mean, this thing is, is ubiquitous and it turns out that when you shake oscillators as when we go back to the physics thereof, <coughs> um, have you, I have another five to 10 minutes? Let's say seven. <laughs> seven. Okay. So, you, so, so, all I wanted to say is that you, we should have a feeling about this time-dependent stuff, and it leads also to all sorts of 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 phase diagrams where the motion is then stable or unstable, and you could second quantize it if you insist, but and you could make it then highly nonlinear. But all in all, in the end, when you start to look back into what happens during this whole machinery of mean field and fluctuations, you start to see very similar shapes, like a potential minimum or a double wells with the symmetry breaking or such a cowboy hat as we saw before. So uh, that led us to the conclusion that many of these open systems, especially when we're looking at uh, Lindblad like description in the many body realm, uh, on their mean field descriptions, they are very, very semi-classical. And, and also the notions of these phase transitions and squeezing, this can be reproduced. So for example, this is a result measured by a half a meter long guitar, sc guitar string, right? This is how you squeeze uh, thermal noise. Um, on top of it, it's important that when you shake the system, it can have subharmonic responses. And this is what people call uh, period doubling bifurcations. And here, for example, the system could have broken its Z2 symmetry, but of course it's overall, uh, until it comes back to itself, it needs to complete a full 360 degree circle, but the potential gets back to itself after 180 degree. So this is, and uh, nowadays, maybe some of you know a bit more like the, the more contemporary uh, name of time crystals, but all of, all of it, boils down to look like a lot of classical effects that we also know and love and will manifest as exceptional points and dissipation induced uh, melting all of this manifests also in the physics of a child on a swing okay uh, nevertheless understanding children on swings can then allow you to understand back coupled many body degrees of freedom at least in their mean field uh, level and then, of course, if you want to then ask more complicated question of what happens when you now couple more of these together, then it starts to be very, very involved. And for this, I just want to give you a couple of, uh, you know, things of where we are looking at uh, today. So the first thing is that there will be a book in August that comes out that summarizes more or less uh, uh, most of what I have been telling you about few degrees of freedom. Um, secondly, in order to solve all of these things, you actually need to come up with a good answer that predicts or estimates what kind of motion should the system have under the different drives and, and coupling, then plug it and solve for all of these stationary things. And it starts to be more and more complicated, the more degrees of freedom you have. And then Javier and, and Jan built a tool that I encourage many of you to try to use. Um, when we want to truly compare then classical and quantum and, and actually challenge my statement that much of this open dynamics is classical, uh, then you need to actually start to compare different perturbation theories from classical and quantum world. And then what we are starting to find is that there are various approximations along the quantum mechanical path that need to, to be revisited in the open system. And we are coming up with better basis for the perturbation series over here and we're correcting uh, 
uh, Floquet expansions with, with the different ansatz that fits to the classical world. Um, at the same time, if you are then interested in, in quantifying and asking what is at all quantum in these open systems, because we are losing coherence all the time, then you need to come up with uh, questions about how, what is at all quantum in an open system. So you can ask yourself, if I have a system that was coupled to a whole environment, how much is region A of a system entangled with the region B of a system, given the fact that I already traced out the environment? Okay, so that's one of the questions one has to do, and you could prove that this is an NP hard problem, and it's very complicated to even define what that should be. And we developed recently also all sorts of quantum measures for trying to, to uh, address this question. And last, I wanted to just uh, comment that all of these exceptional points and all of the treatment that I show you until now, this was very mean field, right? And if you want to go beyond mean field and treat all of these many body interactions properly, this uh, naively looking cubic nonlinearity over here that will be photon photon interactions in, in, a, in a cavity, uh, we try to do that and challenge what will happen in this exceptional point. And when what we did is to use uh, functional renormalization group analysis. I will do that very quickly over here. And then you start to see that there is critical phenomena that there is actually a an interaction region beyond which exceptional points are melted away. So I'm happy to answer questions about it afterwards. And this gives you a very nice quantum to classical uh, machinery as well. So this is what happens at finite temperatures for this story. Uh, that was some uh, shameless uh, um, PR, so to say. Uh, in Mesoscopics, there are various effects where you could actually have that the en environment even makes you have new types of resonances like Kondo, which uh, Lydia works on and also studies entanglement in these type of complex impurity systems. And also, for example, in quantum wires, we have seen that the environment could profoundly change what you would be the uh, signatures of, of quantum phase transitions. So for example, the zero uh, Tunneling density of states bias anomaly in Luttinger liquids can be completely morphed by coupling it to a noisy environment. And with that, I want to wrap up, tell you that this is the competition we're after. This is now a transition from ETH to constants, and we're continuing to work in this direction. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the very nice uh, overview. Um, so we still have time for, but um, well, we have about five minutes for questions. So I invite now questions from the audience. If you have any question, please unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, Ioannis. I think you were the first. Yeah, hi, Adel. Hey, Yanis. Thanks a lot. Very nice talk. Very interesting. Um, I was kind of uh, wondering, uh, in the treatment of the cavity, you assume the coherent state. But yeah. since you're looking things as a function of temperature, um, wouldn't be a, a, a thermal coherent state more appropriate? OK, so first of all, thanks. Uh, we. The treatment with respect to the Dickey model and the experiments from the Esslinger group, um, it was sufficient for them to, because of energy scales of what the cavity is in and what the rotating picture, right. et cetera, to assume that the environment is at zero temperature. Okay, so okay. The, Lin the Lindblad term only had photon loss, actually. Um, of course, much of the introduction I gave, uh, especially with this, um, you know, this picture of melting the order, so to say, that would have needed them to also have uh, the ability to have to swallow uh, photons from the environment that that could have melted the signatures that I was telling you about, and would have required me to also, uh, you know, ad address what should happen to the coherent state in the presence of temperature. 
Thanks a lot. Yeah. Happy. Thanks. Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think Lavi has a question. <clears throat> yeah. I would, and thank you so much for such a, a nice uh, um, pedagogical overview. So I actually have a very naive question. But if, so when you were telling about this exceptional point and you were saying that exceptional point could be seen as like a transition from under damp to the over damp. So I'm just wondering how one would see if one has a higher order exceptional point. Is there a way that one can always have a picture of them also in this fashion? Right. So is, thanks, Navi, for the question. Um, so exceptional points you have to, um, so I, I think of it always a little bit as a, as a um, social uh, reason as to why people got to, to look at them. Mm -hmm. um, namely, when you were looking at Hamiltonians, we know that the, and that the spectrum is real. Mm -hmm. And we know that when the spectrum has gaps in it that close, we will have a phase transition, right? Because for example, oh. the ground state will change because mm -hmm. the gap closed and now the, the level is inverted. Um, then people said, ah, oh, okay, I could uh, maybe ask similar questions in an open system. And then, okay, I move from a Hamiltonian to Liouvillian, so I'm now non-Hermitian, if you wish, or open. Um, mm -hmm. And then people took Lindblad and took a semi-classical limit of Lindblad and obtained again, not a tensor description, but a, a matrix description that they could mm -hmm. diagonalize. And then they said, oh, happy. I have a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. I have a spectrum, but it's no longer real. Let me focus on when it closes and when it not. It does not, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. There is a problem with this uh, uh, philosophy uh, in the sense that, A, you no longer know what kind of, what does the eigenvalues, what kind of an uh, evolution uh, or Green's function or a description do I give to your to my system, given the fact that I know these eigenvalues, right? Because you actually, by throwing away the the um, fluctuation terms from the Lindblad, I no longer conserve probability, and then it's actually not so clear what these values at all mean. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Secondly, these high order and uh, exceptional points, etc., is just accidental touching point of more levels that cross. Yes, yeah. like mm -hmm. having an additional. It, it's like having a, a gap closing in the Hermitian Hamiltonian case that uh, that has the exchange of two levels with two other levels. In the closed system, we would have never made a big issue out of it. It would have just been a higher symmetry point, right? Uh, so, but if you still would do the exercise and diagonalize say, your, your Liouvillian and would try to understand what happens when these complex guys accidentally close at the same time, I would then argue that you just accidentally have two modes that become overdamped at the same time. Okay, 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 I see. Okay. Uh, that okay. would be my take. Okay, yeah. thank you. Happy. So thank you very much. Um, is there any more quick question before we close the session today? All right, so if not, then Let's close the session. <laughs> and I uh, thank you all very much for, for, uh, for attending today. Uh, just um, a quick reminder, next week, we, no, next week will not be um, a session. Next session will be in about a month from now and so it will be the 1st of June by Ewald Frechachen from Amolf. Then next week to that, uh, Jose Lado will give uh, another talk, um, but... That will be it for today. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.